We'll begin this morning with Ellen Steinbaum. Ellen is a poet who grew up in Wilmington, Delaware. She was writing as far back as she can remember, she told me. She went on to work writing articles for newspapers and magazines and as a columnist for the Boston Globe. And Ellen found that she began to become drawn by the form of putting words and ideas into poetry. And as she began writing, uh, her writing took off in, in different ways and in getting published. And she now has two books of published poetry titled Afterwards and Container Gardening. Ellen was nominated for a Pushcart Prize for a poem. Another poem was read by Garrison Keillor on Writer's Almanac. She's the author of a one-woman play she wrote, Centerpiece. And she writes a blog, Reading, Writing, and the Occasional Recipe. And more recently, uh, being remarried uh, and still being a newlywed, uh, Ellen stated that she finds she's writing a lot of poems about love these days. So whatever the words be and the ideas, Please help me give a warm welcome to Ellen Steinbaum. I am just delighted to be here. Um, I was thinking that um, I wanted to start off with some things about the season. Uh, it seems like the season is so much with us right now with all the wonderful colors and scents in the air and, and all that. So um, even though this is titled Sometimes September, we'll think of November because it seems to have some of the same uh, vibe. Sometimes September. Every morning now, we count the morning glories, 23 today, that sprung up while we were sleeping and curl glorious in their one day on the arbor among waning moonflowers, wisteria too new this year for bloom, and grapevines that persist through all our attempts to tear them out. A rush of birds and squirrels harvests corn, acorns, and the Coosa dogwoods dropping fruit. Every year I forget this, how springs all petulance with cold and rain that never end, and summers short, winter forever, but this brightness will open, lit colors clear as morning glories, with curtains blown inward at an empty window, with papers flying above in the air above a desk, with something just about to happen, something just over. Um, as we're getting ready to celebrate Thanksgiving next week, um, I wanted to read a poem that feels to me like Thanksgiving, and it has a word in it that I can't say on television, and I don't want to be bleeped. So it's a very innocent, my, my poems are all so G-rated, and, and it's just strange to me that I happen to have this word in the poem that I want to read today. So I'm going to cue you, and when I cue you, you think the word. <laughs> so you will help me complete the poem. It's called, it's very old, so it still refers to bread and circus, which which is now, of course, Whole Foods. Um, shopping at Bread and Circus after hearing Sharon Olds read poems about her trip into the low-impact wilderness. The poem is slightly longer than the title. <laughs> we glide down aisles, smiles beatific, thoughts pure, our sobs and Volvos parked outside, bumper stickered, free to bet. It is beautiful here. What waits for us like Christmas morning, polished food in perfect pyramids, organic and serene, milk in glass bottles from your grandmother's childhood, fish that swam smiling into the nets, <laughs> or maybe directly into the cases to plant themselves on ice. Animals that ranged free and muscular bef before we got hungry. We leave only money. We take only food, homeopathic recipes, and aromatherapy sheep. 
<laughs> Shelf life is short here. Infant eggplants, artichokes, zucchini reaching their destinies fast. Baby spinach ripped from its mother earth. <laughs> Still soft and small, like the sweetly sticky toddlers in our shopping carts. It is convenient here, effortless to hunt and gather, signs grammatical, and even the radicchio and mesclin spelled correctly. <laughs> Pale restrooms with changing tables, we leave our where we can, secure in knowing that the fruit and coffee pickers live in cozy bungalows and send their picker children to progressive schools. Maybe we should have shortened the days of the miserable penned veals instead of the gambling ones roaming bright meadows with the chicken parts and lamb chops in Bambi-esque nirvana. <laughs> but it is beautiful here, here in the blonde wood aisles, here in the glow of unbleached cotton. It is beautiful here. We are one with the world. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, so while I'm thinking of things that we are thankful for, um, this is a poem that I wrote a few years ago when I had a residency at the um, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and there were a number of wonderful uh, visual artists there at the same time that I was there. And there was one woman who was a visual artist who, before she started doing any art, created this wonderful environment for herself. And it was just stuff she found, little sticks and stones and twigs and things, but she created this wonderful feeling that was so serene and perfect. And um, so this is called In Anne's Studio. Before even the first line is drawn is order. Each twig breathes and each seed pod lies calm in its deliberate space. Spare, but like those Dutch still lifes with ripe fruit, fly, fat rabbit still furred with its quickness, and light shining down just so on polished grapes, draped cloth, this too. What the world is made of, leaves, paper shreds, stones, a meditation of things, each object in its honored place, showing us what is holy in this life is noticing. And I have the great pleasure today of having uh, my daughter, one of my daughters here, and one of my grandchildren, and um, a sort of a bribe to get him to come here. I wrote a poem for, for him. His name is Cameron, <laughs> and um, he uh, is here at a poetry reading, not his first, but I think the other ones were probably when he was so young that he didn't remember. So this is called For Cameron at the Poetry Reading. First, breathe them in. These words are for you. Pile them up, yellow and orange, and leap into them. Gather them with your arms stretched wide. Fill yourself with the smell and taste of them. Feel them hum through you. Next, choose your own and lay a path of them. Not only those that sparkle to you, but the shy grays and browns that lie half hidden in the dirt. The ones you pick from top branches or find washed onto sand by steady tides. The ones that call with their music, their perfume. There are stories here that have been told for generations. Listen for them. They have been handed down, 
painted with fire, stitched with bright silk. Come close now, I am going to whisper. And I realized when I wrote that, that I actually had another Cameron poem. So I'm going to read that one too. And this is something that he won't remember, but I think his mother will. It's called, hmm, wrong page. It's called Small Accident. And if I can find it, yes, here, Small Accident. The fall was fast and innocent. Nothing sharp or speeding was involved. No great harm, his lip, her scraped knee. She tripped, he was in front, they both went down. A blink, then it was over. By morning it will be almost fine, but now he tongues the swollenness be beneath the ice cube. You pushed me down, he says. No tears, no accusation, just the facts and small surprise while she swallows down the thickness in her throat. You're supposed to protect me. You're my mother. Ah. Guilt, guilt, guilt. <laughs> um, Tomorrow's my birthday, so I thought I'd read a poem called Birthday. This is from my first book afterwards, which is very explicitly, which very explicitly deals with loss. So it's, it's not entirely a celebratory birthday poem. Birthday. And so I move another year away. I have a new haircut now, but you would recognize me still I look exactly as if I were the same. You will not grow old or stooped or, or slowed. Caught in crystal time, you wait while I wear out. While my body imperceptibly accumulates the weight of passing days that we will spend apart. I will be older than you will ever be. I will pass your age, become so old that I am new, and change a minute at a time until nothing is left of the me you knew. Until the space between us lengthens so that one day if you saw me, if such a thing were possible, you would mistake me for a smiling distant relative an elderly aunt from crumbling photo albums. You might sense a vague resemblance and wonder if we'd ever met. Um, well, in the whole scheme of loss, which many of my poems have in them, um, there's always the choice of whether we're going to protect ourselves or, or live fully and with the acceptance of all the risks involved. So that's what I was thinking when I wrote this poem, which is dedicated to a young man named Jason, who was a lovely young man who died much too soon. Yesterday, the damp earth smell rising around us, we mounded up the ground, breaking the hard clods with our fingers to sift them gently down. How you would have loved that all our backs bore muddy evidence of hugging. Today we wake alone, resume irrelevant breathing, recognizing even the best end badly leaving, being left, the difference merely temporary. Lemmings, we run to what destroys us, condemned to give our hearts to what is mortal. We guard ourselves, hunched shouldered against the heavy sunlight, hardwired to crave the touch that burns us every time. The choice resting in our own wounded arms, hold back, we dry and shrivel, embrace, we are undone. Well, as Cheryl mentioned, I um, 
I'm newly married and have um, a lot of new poems that are sort of love poems, so I'm going to read some of those. The Rose from Beauty and the Beast. Like the rose from Beauty and the Beast, I tell him, but he has not seen Beauty and the Beast, not seen that rose under glass, marking the time when, if the beast finds true love, he can become a handsome prince again. That rose with the petals slowly, slowly dropping away, the last one hanging on impossibly long. But he has not seen this. He has only gone into the garden, cut one huge and perfect rose, full blown, now two weeks old at least, in the vase on my nightstand where I have not even remembered to change the water. But the rose is beyond all expectation, still open, full with every petal stretched out and not one yet drooping, dropping, browning at an edge or showing any other sign of coming to an end. Okay, are we at five? Um, this is um, a poem about buying stamps, basically, a hundred forevers. He's bought the wrong ones, asked me to take them back, and so I slide the puny roll of 42s, those undistinguished flags, across the counter and ask, can I exchange this? And for just two dollars more, have a hundred forevers. Forever, not, we know, a word to be believed, but a note to be held on past breath. The Dennis Beach beyond the oyster beds where sand blurs into fog. Or the unlikeliness of this, our stunned contentment that has not as yet eroded into boredom, irritation, those sodden, all too human states that could unspangle our small future. But, the, but enormity turns doubt aside in this quantity, no option but belief. I'm going to end with a poem that my daughter Deborah, the, the daughter who is here, Cameron's mother, uh, had asked me to write a number of years ago for her wedding. Um, it's uh, for Deborah and her husband, Mike, who just celebrated their anniversary recently. And it's kind of a benediction of what I wish for, not only for them, but for all of us. Now begins the dailiness. More days, if we are lucky, than we will think to count, piling up like shelter at our door. Feathered twigs and bits of string will weave day upon day, and we will lean unthinking on this solidness rest within the wonder of this gift. Thank you very much.
ask if I'm late Take the fear and take the time to set it free Open our minds so the heart can see Listen to the voice of a stranger Hear what other words have to say Listen to the language of children around the world Let them bring to us a brighter day to preface this first poem by um, by saying that I no longer feel this way which is good news and I was um, I was listening to Ellen's poem earlier about the fall and the colors and everything and thinking um, you know I'm glad that I, I experienced that much more than I did at the time that I wrote this first poem it's called dreading winter the advent of fall fills my heart with sadness winter will follow with frozen fingers grasping at my throat, throttling, causing consciousness to scatter. Ice crystals splayed on windows, evidence of a struggle I cannot win. The prospect of winter alone grieves me. Why do I find myself once more unattached, like an old shutter flapping flagrantly in the fierce winds of winter? Lethargic, I laze under layers of down, hunkered down for warmth for going wanting for now, but for giving winter, never. And the second poem, totally different subject. Um, it's actually about my mother, uh, actually our relationship, I guess I could say. And in a way, it's, a, I guess, a, a little love note of sorts. Weekend with mom. Constant chatter. No space for silences, where thoughts grow, feelings germinate. I feel I'm being subjected to a litany of news, some good, some bad, most already heard. What's to fear in silence between us, mother? I've come to share your heart. Instead, you empty your mind. That space where new thoughts and feelings spawn, littered like an unkempt yard. It still feels like home, having always been this way. But sometimes I dream of a place where wildflowers bloom in their seasons. No need to preen or prune, perfect in their wild abstraction. I do my best to accept you as you are, chatter and all. I know that you care and love me, and I feel the same. It's just a quirky connection, a cluttered yard, with love scattered like seeds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, everyone here, for a very inspiring morning. I'm going to read to you a, a poem called Friends. It was part of a script that I wrote for a documentary called Musical Friends about two members of the Claflin Hill Orchestra. Friends. 
Friends open doors to undiscovered parts of ourselves. Some doors burst free, lighthearted laughter. Others bring us shoulder to shoulder, christening brothers or sisters. Some open wide, dark caverns, holding things avoided, mirrors reflecting, stinging truths of a self unknown. Birthing, transforming truth. Pushing beyond expectations, boundaries, or limits, we find friends open doors, friends open hearts, raise us higher toward heaven. I'm Dr. Nancy Rappaport. Suicide is a difficult topic to discuss, but one that needs open communication. Suicide is the third leading cause of death among 10 to 24 year olds, and it's on the minds of far too many young people. A national survey of high school students discovered that one in seven said that they were seriously considering taking their own lives. Deaths from suicides are only part of the problem. Every year, some 150,000 youth receive emergency care for self-inflicted wounds. Suicide leaves family and friends shocked and confused with unanswered questions about what might have been done to avoid such tragedies. Research has allowed us to identify risk factors, warning signs, causes of suicide, and strategies for prevention. Visit the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention at AFSP.org to learn more.